All right, so this lecture here is going to be in conjunction with uh, the video about posture where I look at forward head posture, uh, increased kyphosis of the thoracic spine, and um, those are together with lordotic posture and the sway back posture. Uh, and then this video is going to accompany this to really understand how we use the plumb line and how other uh, biomechanic deviations uh, will change our posture. So take a look here at the plumb line itself. And in our clinic, you can see those um, on the curtains, those strings hanging down with the keys on them. That's actually what those are going to be. So you need to practice uh, positioning uh, your fellow classmates and us instructors in front of that and analyzing our postures, okay, and seeing where the deviations are. So looking at the plumb line, where it starts kind of right in the middle of the foot, sometimes you'll see it titled, um, oops, as just anterior to the malleolus, okay? What about the middle of that foot? Then we get up to the knee. It is slightly in, or uh, the plumb line so it depends on what you're talking about too. I guess we need to talk about that, like whether or not you're talking about the part of the body and its relationship to the plumb line or the plumb line in relationship to the body. Usually people discuss it from the plumb line in relationship to the body. So the plumb line at the knee is anterior to the knee. So it kind of runs right between the kneecap and then that lateral epicondyle. So the axis of rotation lateral epicondyle when we're using the goniometer. So slightly anterior to that. So then if you see a deviation, you should be thinking about what's tight and what is weak. You should always be able to think about that. So if someone has genu recurvatum, so hyperextension of the knee, where is the plumb line going to be in relationship to the knee? Is it going to be one more anterior or two, posterior to the knee? And the answer should be if someone has genu recurvatum, number one, okay? Because if their knee is hyperextended, this line is gonna move back to here. I mean, hopefully not that far, that would be insane, but about like that, okay? So then we think about patients, um, especially when they're weak, their knees start to flex, so it starts to move forward in this direction. So now the plumb line becomes posterior to the knee sometimes. And then we need to start thinking about, well, what muscles are being overworked? They're not necessarily getting stronger, they're being overworked. So if your knee is partially flexed, your quads are just way overworking, way overworking Be, um, to try to hold you up. If you right now try to stand in a slightly squatted position and then walk around the house like a modified duck walk, that's not gonna be very comfortable for very long. And that's what's happening. And that's why patients who are in that position, you can see how your energy just drains a ton. That's why they are so weak. So it's important to get them out of that posture. Looking here at the hip, the plumb line falls slightly posterior to the hip, okay? So this is gonna to wanna to fall this way. This is why we have that Y ligament, the iliofemoral ligament. Okay, so if we have weak glutes, this is where we've talked about the weak glute, and actually this connects to the sway back posture, so make sure to check that video out if you have not already. If your glutes are weak, then you're gonna lean back and you'll be on that Y ligament. And what'll happen is the plumb line, if you, do sway, if you have a sway back posture, is going to move posterior. So your hip is going to be more and more into extension, okay? So the whole pelvis is like shifting forward. If you have strong glutes, then you can get this to the correct spot. So you're able to have that slightly anterior because like I said, you um, it would fall into that extension. So, but the, the glutes help stabilize that hip. And then we get to the second sacral vertebrae. That's really, not only is this a major landmark that it runs through, but this is your center of gravity or center of mass, okay? And that'll be important when we start talking about balance in the next video and the center of gravity and mass in relationship to the base of support. 
So coming up through here, through the spine, we should see um, you know, the proper amount of kyphosis of the thoracic spine and lordosis of the lumbar spine, and then the same thing at the cervical spine. So that right through the external, whoops, auditory, external auditory meatus. Also the mastoid process, that's where that plumb line should be falling there. And most people, because they're in forward head posture, their head's gonna be way forward, so the plumb line is gonna be way posterior to where it needs to be. Now this is a detailed picture for a lateral view, but we actually have three views we should be taking. So this is just the lateral view. So let's look at the other views we should also be taking anterior view. These views are pretty easy because really we're looking for symmetry. Okay, so are the shoulders level? Oops, get back to draw. Are the shoulders level? Is the head tilted one way or the other? The eyes offset? Is it splitting straight through the uh, nares, through, right through the nose? Uh, are the nipples in line with each other? What do we see? Uh, we might be able to see some rotation of the shoulder here. We definitely, if we go back to the lateral view, if you think about the lateral view, you'll be able to see, and if you imagine, let's say this goes right through the shoulder joint, it'd be a good landmark. Then if the plumb line is posterior to the shoulder, then we know the shoulder is anterior, and we got that rounded, internally rotated shoulder for that forward head posture or increased thoracic kyphosis. So pretty much everything just needs to split everything. Now down here though, I talked about genuricular bottom at the knee. What can we see in the frontal view or the anterior view here? We should be able to see valgus and varus. So just a reminder, let's go down here. This is where you're gonna see those deviations, the valgus and varus. So the knock need for the valgus, the bow legged for the varus. Got your varus, got your valgus. And there's your genuine ricker bottom right there. So this is where you can make connections. We look at this posture, we see it's genuine ricker bottom. We know that they're probably have weak quads, right? So we can start making these connections. So is there an issue with the femoral nerve? No idea. So things to think about. Um, Let's see, what else we got on there? It's pretty good. Uh, you also can see uh, pronation and supination at the feet. You can also see it better in the posterior view. You know, we talked about doing slow motion walking as someone's walking away from you. That's always a really nice way to try to, um, you can really see what's happening or if, even if they're just standing there, take a picture and show them. And for whatever reason, this picture's staying blurry, but a posterior view, pretty much the same thing. Everything needs to be in line, just like with this guy. Gluteal cleft the head, shoulders, but what you can see in the posterior view, probably supination, pronation better, is scoliosis. This is where we're gonna get into that spine. So we're gonna be able to see scoliosis from the posterior view. So two big things we need to get out of, of scoliosis, well, actually there's more than two, but let's, in terms of defining it, there's going to be structural versus non-structural. Non-structural, can be corrected, structural cannot. So this is the spine is made that way. Can be corrected, we'll talk about some of those ways in a minute. But over here to the left you can see the scoliosis. Now, how do we define the scoliosis? It's defined by the convex portion. We find that by starting at the bottom and working up. So look at this guy's pelvis here. As you start to go up, it curves to the left. Now, some students would like to tell you it's curving to the right here. Well, even if you start at the head and come down, it's staying pretty straight anyway to there. So I would argue that's still not an accurate way to do it. But right here, you can see that it's pushed to the left. So that's where it's convex on the left. So the left side's convex. So this is left side. Oops, get that pen back. This is left side. 
And you can have a debate whether or not you think this is lumbar or thoracic, but let's just call it because uh, it's right at the end of the thoracic. Let's call it left thoracic scoliosis. So this picture, of course, is full of ambiguity about which part of it. But if you see that in the diagnosis, then you, you should expect, obviously, that presentation. So it always is based off of the convex side. And with that, we should be thinking about on the convex side, these muscles are going to be stretched more and weaker. On the concave side, those muscles are going to be tighter. So we need to stretch those guys. Especially when this gets up into the thoracic area up higher and we start having scoliosis where the heart is even more affected. If you think about that heart on the left side, oops, let's put that red. It's the heart, why wouldn't it be red? There's your heart. Now, especially if the heart's on the convex side, or I'm sorry, not the convex, the concave side, everything's a little more squished. So that actually is gonna make it harder for the heart to pump and you're not gonna have, uh, your left lung is not gonna be able to expand as much because we're compressing that side. So the heart's gonna have to work harder to increase the blood pressure to get it out of there. Your lung won't be able to expand. So we should definitely expect to see some cardiac and pulmonary um, impairments with a patient who has scoliosis uh, in the upper half of their back. And you can check that out on the multiple cardiopulmonary videos as well if you wanna get more in depth with that. But we will get more in depth no matter what. So. The structural means you can't change it. The non-structural means you can. So how can we change it? Well, sometimes there's a leg length discrepancy. So remember that we have the coxa varus, oops, varus and valgus. This is gonna give you a leg length discrepancy if these are not even, or if you have one side's normal, the other side's varus, we're gonna have a leg length discrepancy. So this can still be fixed though. You can literally put a heel lift or a shoe lift in and now you fix the leg length discrepancy. So that's, and then once you fix the leg length discrepancy, the scoliosis goes away. That's why it's non-structural of the, of the spine. Obviously if one knee has more varus or valgus than the other, that's gonna cause a leg length discrepancy. So the leg length discrepancy tests are really good to make sure we're checking so that we know maybe pain from the back is coming from the legs. Knee extension is going to change the leg length. Pronation, supination. If they're not even, that's why the symmetry is so important. If supination is bad on both sides or pronation is bad on both sides, maybe we don't have a leg length discrepancy, but it needs to have symmetry. So you should be thinking about, that's why we have the three views. You're going to find this in the posterior view generally. That's going to be your best. The genuricurvatum, you're going to see more in the lateral view the frontal view here, valgus and varus. Uh, you might get, it's harder to see the hip, but you might see the hip and you can see a leg length discrepancy there. What if you're looking at the frontal view and one knee is higher than the other? Then you know. And um, yeah, there you go. So we've talked since the beginning of the program that the first way we really assess and begin treating a patient through the assessment is with our eyes we see the patient or we see the patient's chart. Always assess with your eyes. The eyes are gonna to lead to your instinct and you're gonna be able to tell what's wrong. And through experience, you're gonna be able to tell even easier what's wrong. And you're like, I don't even need to go into your MMT. I can, honestly, I can just look and I can tell what's going on. And you can start to assess from there. So our eyes are our first way to assess and the plumb line and posture is the first easiest way to start to see where we need to do some work. So, and if you learned anything from this video, hit subscribe, uh, have connections to other videos uh, linked in the bottom corner here. So feel free to keep checking some stuff out.